Aloha, everyone, and welcome to the Empowered Hour. I am very excited for my guest today. So we have Yudit Sadiqman. Uh, Aloha, Yudit. How are you? I'm doing great. How are you? I'm doing well. And what part of the world are you in? Well, I'm talking to you now from Jerusalem, Israel, and it's actually evening here after a very long day. Um, but I am so excited to be here with you. I'm excited to have you. So uh, I could go down a long list of all of your accolades because there's so many, uh, but I wanted to see if you could just give an overview of who you are in the world, what you're doing, and um, a little bit of your background. That would be great. Fantastic. So um, my current uh, position in the world is CEO of My Power. Um, My Power is a digital company that's looking at how to take the knowledge and learning and teaching of empowerment self defense and uh, put it into a digital platform. Uh, not online classes and not, um, you know, a virtual course, but an app that actually allows the user to become their own empowerment self-defense instructor. So the the app is about being the tools you need to help you step into your own power. Um, Until we started this project and started this company, Um, I've been involved in the empowerment and self-defense movement um, for the better part of the last 25 years. Um, I actually am about to celebrate uh, 30 years in the martial arts. I started as a 28-year-old mother of four um, because my neighbor convinced me to be the last person she needed to open a judo class for adult women. Um, I had never d- done judo before in a classroom, but I had bought a book from S- 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 Scholastic Books, you know, in school. I was like, oh, this looks so cool. And I would do it with my little brother on my parents' bed until he got tired of me throwing him all over the place. Uh-huh. Um, so it was kind of like a, a dream revisited. And um, shortly after my divorce, I got very involved in the women's martial arts and self-defense movement. And it has been such a healing path for me. Um, That's wonderful. That's amazing. Um, Well, thank you for sharing. The app, I absolutely love the app. And I I think that it's really innovative that you are going about it the way that you are, where everyone actually gets to be their own instructor. Uh, What was the methodology behind that? Just because I know that so many teachers, um, that's that's quite a controversial stance, but I think that it's so empowering for people, especially when they might be in a disempowering situation. So one of the things I've learned over the years as an instructor um, is that I can't possibly know how the group in an in-person training in front of me is going to behave in that classroom. Like I can guess, I can assume, I can do lots of things, but I can't really know until I start to work with them. So um, one of the organizations that I uh, was a co-founder of in 2003 is El Alev, which is in Israel. And what we became really good at was teacher training. And one of the things that we realized is teacher training is not about me handing you a curriculum and saying, teach this. Teacher training is about me understanding who you are and what you bring to the classroom and giving you the skills to assess what's going on with the group in front of you and then help, you know, and then the the games and the tools and the techniques and whatever you need to teach 
to help facilitate their process of stepping into their personal power. So you may get a, a, a classroom full of soccer players, or you may get a classroom full of soccer moms. And, and guess what? You're never going to get a homogeneous group. So you could have 10% soccer moms and 2% personal trainers and 1% older people and 4%, you know, you're just always going to get a mix. And not only are you going to get a mix, you're going to get a mix of people who learn differently. Some who learn kinesthetically, some who learn visually, some who learn auditory. And you've got to figure out how to deliver the material in a way that it speaks to everyone, even though everyone hears it differently or sees it differently or feels it differently. So, so the, the trick is learning how to be aware of, are you speaking in enough different ways? Are you bringing enough different material to the classroom so that everybody feels like this process makes sense for them? Um, not to mention, you have no idea what everybody's trauma is when they walk into the room. And you know, we all know and we all repeat constantly one in three women. And every woman, when it comes to the microaggressions and the, you know, discriminations and all of that stuff, how do I know what I'm going to say that's going to trigger somebody in my room or what story one of the students is going to tell that's going to trigger a different student? And then do I know how to bring everybody back to a balanced, grounded place so that we can then continue on our journey? So um, the app. Um, I believe the app speaks the language of the three different modalities of learning. And which means that if you're a kinesthetic learner, you're going to repeat the physical pieces of the game over and over and over again until you feel comfortable with it. And if you're a, if, you know, a, an auditory learner, you're going to listen to the things that we say in the ways we say it over and over and over again until you feel like you've absorbed it. Um, and we have that balance of grounding exercises in community so that you're not going through this alone. Um, you're, you're going through this process, even though you are doing the process with the app, you have a community you can share with. You have a community who you can say, I really don't agree with lesson six. Like they said some things that really bother me. Okay, let's talk about it. You know, let's have a discussion about it. Or, oh my God, why didn't somebody tell me when I was in high school what we just learned in lesson nine? Like, I wish I would have had that then. If I would have had it then, I wouldn't have this and I wouldn't have that. So that community piece is very important for the process. And it's also important for the piece that we talk about that's tell. So, you know, ESD is built on the foundation of think, yell, run, fight, tell. And these are categories that actually have a lot of breadth to them, right? You know, the easiest one to explain is yell, right? Because yell is everything from no to wow, I really don't like the way you just spoke to me. Both of those are yell. They're on the yell spectrum because they're using your voice to speak up for yourself. And this voice is just as important as that, as that loud, big, badass voice. They're both as important. Okay, well, how do you get here? Maybe you have to practice a little bit of this, that loud stuff, in order to feel more comfortable with the, with the soft voice. Mm -hmm. And maybe you need to do the psychosocial work. That it's not just about the physical skills. Yes, physical skills and verbal skills and psychosocial skills. And these are all important. And I believe we've been able to 
distill the teaching method that has been created over the last 20 some odd years into an app that can support a user's process in what do I need to be able to advocate for myself and stand up for myself and feel strong and powerful as best as I can in navigating my life. And yeah. can't wait for it to come out. I'm so excited to be able to test drive this. Yeah, I'm excited to see it too. I uh, I was also thinking as, as a domestic violence survivor, how crucial, how important this app can be for people in that situation. And I noticed that um, in a presentation uh, recently, you talked about some certain uh, tools that people can use if they need to suddenly switch gears or change things around. So um, once the switch gears in the sense of, I don't wanna get caught using this app? Yes, yeah. Okay, so yes. Look, when we were talking about, can we, can we? The whole other conversation is, should we, okay? First, we have to get through the can we. Can we put something into an app form that actually lives up to the integrity of what we teach in ESD? Absolutely believe we can. Okay. How do we protect people who are using it? Okay, that's important too. So yes, we have a, I'm not sure I'm supposed to share what we designed for this, but we have a um, method of hiding the app. We have a method of hiding the app um, so that it looks like an everyday normal, uh, I'm just, you know, I'm just looking up a new recipe kind of thing, you know? So, um, you know, if you're using the app and, hey, what are you doing? And you shake the, the phone, it turns itself in if you've made the set the setting. And that is important to me. And I'm going to explain why. Okay. I do not believe that every woman in the world should walk around terrified that she has to hide, that she's learning how to stand up for herself. And I want them to have the ability to choose that I'm concerned about my safety right now. And therefore, I choose to put this on. I don't believe in making choices for others. I believe in giving them the freedom to choose what they need to be as safe as they can be. And that's the first step of empowering people. You know, when it comes to uh, this work, it you're so passionate about it. And I could tell instantly when I met you in uh, 2019. Um, and usually that passion comes from a story. So I was wondering if you had a reason why you are so passionate about self-defense and you, uh, you know, that spearheaded you doing this work for so many people. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um... I am the survivor of sexual assault as a child. And when I tell my story, there are many people who say, well, that doesn't sound like sexual assault to me. Because I was in love with him. Because it was consensual. Because it was a long-term relationship. And it was from age 12. So at age 12, I did not have the skills or the maturity or the knowledge or the anything to be able to make a decision as to whether or not having a relationship with a member of the clergy who was a 27-year-old was okay or not. Because he was sweet and he was good looking and he convinced me that this was our special secret and that people wouldn't understand, but that he loved me and, and then my entire childhood, my entire um, 
you know, adolescence became being his sex slave. Mm. Willingly, because I didn't know any better. And I was convinced this is what love was. And I was convinced that this is what a good relationship was about. And at that time, I was convinced that I was going to marry him one day. Like, you know, I, this, we, you know, sent, you know, letters to each other and we, you know, spent hours on the phone. And every time I could sneak away from my family, I would be with him. Um, and, and it was so wrong in so many ways. Um, and yet I couldn't see that. All I could see was I had this beautiful relationship and that I was managing the pain of having to hide a secret, of not being able to share with anyone, of, not, of, of knowing there's something not okay, of, of being invisible, being absolutely invisible except to him. Mm. And, and that brought me to the brink of, first of all, it, sent me down a road of drugs, bad drugs, um, which I can't blame him for because he never introduced the drugs, but he also never stopped me from using them hmm. or did anything to protect me except to protect me to be his. And at, you know, at some point I was, I was sleeping with people for drugs because it was the only way I could afford it. And I had gotten that first phone call of, do you want to have sex for money? Mm. And somewhere, so here I am, upper middle class Jewish girl in a lovely suburban community. And my drug pushing boyfriend, not not the sexual abuser, but the one who I'm getting the drugs from is trying to pimp me. And somewhere, somewhere in my brain, I thought it was, I, I, I see it as a God thing. That light bulb went off like, no, you can't do that. That's, that's a line you don't step over. And that started me on this wake up process. And that wake up process actually brought me to religion. Um, and that religious place took me to, I am the worst human being on the face of the earth. I don't know how to take care of myself. I don't know how to make good decisions. Look at where I got to. And I married the first guy who asked me. Mm. Because in the religious community, that's how you prove you are normal. Mm. Um, and that's the, that's the, you know, as far as they're concerned, that's the formula for being normal and having the perfect life is get married, have kids, do it, do the right thing. Love, peace, and granola. We can do this. Love, peace, granola, and God. We're good. And nobody told me what the red flags are for nar narcissistic behavior. And nobody told me what gaslighting was and nobody had taught me what uh, emotional abuse was and nobody told me that you can actually be raped within a marriage um and somewhere five children later i started waking up i i believe the judo helped me reclaim my body and and then I started reclaiming my voice. And when I left my marriage, that was the first time I stood up for myself ever, was looking at my husband and saying, you wanna make every decision for everything in our lives, fine. You don't tell me what to do about my judo, not where, not who, not when, not how, judo is mine. And you know something about setting boundaries? It's empowering and it's addictive. It's a good addictive. Because all of a sudden I felt like 
I am me and I'm standing up for myself right here. And slowly I said, oh, you know what? You're also gonna help around the house a little bit because I can't do this all by myself. And we're gonna make this change and we're gonna make that change. And, and at some point it was, yeah, no, sorry. You're not willing to be a partner in this. It's the, you need to take care of everything show and I'm not buying that anymore. Um, and then I got introduced to one of the most wonderful organizations that I've ever worked with, which is the National Women's Martial Arts Federation, the NWMAF. And I met a plethora of amazing women martial artists. Oh my God, I never knew women did things like this. You know, as far as I knew, there was judo and karate. There wasn't anything else. And all of a sudden, did Arnis and, and Aido and Hapkido and these, these things that these women were doing and they moved and they were powerful and they were amazing. And they taught empowerment, self-defense or what was at that time called women's self-defense or um, women's personal safety. I, we, you know, we've been arguing about what to call this for the last two decades at least. Um, and, uh, and that just opened this like, boom, wow, I want more, I want deeper. I want, I want to understand everything about this. Um, and, I know without a shadow of a doubt, it saved my life. No question about it. And not just metaphorically, actually. <laughs> um, because I had gotten to a point where, you know, I had made all this change and I had chosen right and I had made the right decisions and I was looking for the holy, happy, wonderful life. And it was as if I was still the celestial toilet. No matter what I did, no matter what decision I made, I was still, the, the, the heavens were still shitting on me. And it, until I was able to say, I want a divorce, and I am going to be 100% authentically me. And it was as if God went, no, yeah, I'm waiting for you to make this decision. There we go. <laughs> now you're going to have a ride. Um, it's a beautiful story. Thank you for sharing with me. Um, and love looks a lot different now. It looks very happy. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Um, you know, it, it's interesting. I was, I was speaking with a teenager who is going through a really tough time. You know, complicated family, complicated divorce low self-esteem issues with, you know, her looks and her hair and whatever. And um, I happened to run into her and her mom. And her mom said to me, my daughter wants me to tell you that she really loves your hair. And her daughter was standing right next to her. <laughs> now, I'm, you know, I've got the, you know, I'm all blue and green and I'm purple and I'm having fun. And I looked at her daughter straight in the eyes and I said, it is taking me many, many, many years to love my hair too. Oh, yeah. It's a journey, and right? It is totally a journey. You know, I, you know from our level one course that we sing, I love my hips. I love my hips, I love my hips, I love my hips, I love my hips. Why? And you do this in a group. How many people do you know ever say that to themselves? Not a lot. I mean, more when they take classes. <laughs> <laughs> so until, until they're introduced to it with us, I'm pretty sure nobody has ever gotten up in the morning and walked around their bedroom going, I love my hips, I love my hips, I love, especially your hips. Okay, I love my eyes, maybe. I love my lips, maybe. I love my hands, okay. 
almost, I have never met a woman who would admit to loving her hips. Okay, they're either too big, too small, whatever. But they never, it's kind of like the Jewish holidays, never on time. Too early, too late, they're never really on time. So the same thing with hips, they're never perfect. So I think I ended up getting a little bit um, of an adverse feeling about my hips when I was on a date and I never slept with this person. It was maybe like date two or date three. And they said that I had nice birthing hips. <laughs> okay. And I thought, oh. <laughs> Oh, oh. So it wasn't until I heard your song that I was like, okay. <laughs> I'm, gonna reclaim, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna reclaim this for me. <laughs> um, exactly. because no, I'm sorry, I'm not your baby machine, baby making yes. machine. Yeah, oh like God. really. It's horrible. <laughs> you know, it, it's like my saying, oh, you must be a really good sperm donor. <laughs> Oh I love God. those eyes. That makes you a really great sperm donor. Ouch. Yeah. And uh, all right, we could totally go down the rabbit hole on why people think that they have the right to make comments like that. And, and isn't that the culture we're trying to change? Yes. Yes, it is. Absolutely. I should be okay with loving my body from tippy toe to the top of my head without worrying about any songs others have planted in my brain. I get to sing the song of me. And, and I believe that the work we do in ESD, especially with ESD Global and the teacher training programs and getting people to understand how to bring this into your everyday lives, whether you teach as an instructor full-time or not, but getting it into the, wait a minute, it's okay for me to sing my own praises. It's okay for me to want to feel safe. It's okay for me to have an opinion. It's okay for me to not, to set a boundary, you know, and, um, and want to live in a world where everybody respects that. Well, I remember, I remember in 2019 coming back home and looking at my relationship and we've been together for over eight and a half years. Um, but you know, that, that moment when I came back home, and I realized I can't live the same way I've been living. And so I ended up doing exactly what you were saying of like, I think you need to clean up more. I think you need to help me out more with, you know, things around the house. Um, I would really like it if you do X, Y, and Z. Um, and the sad thing about um, media and what we've been told is that I kept on waiting for him to leave. And he didn't leave. He just was never asked for, you know, to do all of those things. And so you actually are with a good human being who was saying, oh, cool. I could do that. Didn't think about it. And yeah, you're right. I'd like to be part of more part of things. I just didn't think about it. Or, you know, and yeah. If we don't ask, how do we get? I, I, I'll share, uh, my, my, my current partner and I are slightly different. I am a big extrovert and she's an introvert. And, and that's fine. And we've learned our language, you know, when we go to something that's very extroverted, she knows how to give me cues that I, you know, we, I know she wants to go. And we then can make an adult decision. Okay, why don't you take a cab home? Because I still want to stay. And there's no hard feelings there. Or I'll go, you know, I've had enough too. It's, we can go now. We're good. But it's not an emotional battle. It's yeah. just clear. You know, cool. You've got only so much battery for people. I have a bigger battery for people. <laughs> That's it. 
And it's okay for you to say, oh, it's two people a year for me. Okay, but the answer doesn't have to me be that I leave too. Like you shouldn't be insulted that I wanna stay and you need to take a cab home, that's fine. And I don't need to be insulted that you don't wanna stay with me, right? It, it, it's not either or, but that comes from communicating. Yes and communicating without baggage. Yep. Communicating with, okay, we need to understand this. What, what about this bothers you? I wanna understand what you're feeling because I care about you. Well, okay. And now I'm gonna share with you what I'm feeling because I care about me too. Yes. And let's figure out a way where neither of us has to compromise, but we can both understand. You understand that I'm not trying to hurt you by wanting to stay. And I understand that you're not trying to hurt me by trying to get me out of there earlier than I want to go. But that we have different needs and that's part of being human. <laughs> Yes. And the communication piece is huge. Yeah. It, it changes everything. So it's wonderful. So I am thrilled that you were able to take what you learned and set boundaries. And it worked. Yes. Isn't that cool? Yes. <laughs> it was fabulous. And I, um, yeah, the first day that I met you, we had a share of foam noodles. It was really, oh, yes. <laughs> really fabulous. And I um I was just before the pandemic, uh, I was working at the Fairmont Resort doing empowerment training. And there was a guy there who had the choice between uh doing yoga with his wife or taking my class. <laughs> <laughs> he happened to be uh the hockey coach in LA. <laughs> so I feel like it came around full circle. <laughs> I remember us like basically our hands on our knees, like breathing heavy. And we looked up and we had a whole slew of faces staring at us from the restaurant. Uh, but I just had your face pop into my head. I was like, this is payback. <laughs> there you go, celestial payback. And, and, and the funny part about it is, I'm no longer getting shot on by God. <laughs> so, you know, he, he got you back. <laughs> and I learned, I learned a very good lesson from that, from that afternoon is when I ask for a volunteer, I always ask if they have a background in martial arts. <laughs> <laughs> I look so unsuspecting though. So it worked out. <laughs> no, 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 no. No, dumb once, not dumb twice. Fool me once, <laughs> shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. <laughs> Well, you do, you have uh, so much knowledge and expertise. I'm wondering if you could share a piece of wisdom for uh, your younger self or some of our young people out there viewing. Wow. Um, yeah, so we are all a complicated, complex combination of attributes. Absolutely no one is the same. And everyone is here with a special job to do in this world. Um, and what I wish for everyone who's listening to this is believe in your specialness, Surround yourself with people who support you being exactly who you are and do good. Like it, it that's it. It, it, it's, it's a really simple, it, it's not selfish to wanna to take care of yourself in order to do good for humanity. So what comes with selfishness is I'm doing good just to do good for me. And it's all about me and doing me and doing me best and being better than everybody else. 
it, it is totally okay to take care of yourself, but you bring something special to the world. You bring a special talent, whether it's music or art or becoming a doctor or whatever it may be, or being an activist or being a farmer or whatever it may be, but your specialness only you can bring to the world, bring it fully and bring it for the benefit of everyone. And um, I, I wish I could have believed in myself um, a lot earlier, rather than just believing I was a mistake and broken and, and it was not in any way my parents' fault for that. You know, my parents have always been supportive and loving and super confused as to what was going on with me rightfully so yeah so. yeah thank you and how can people get a hold of you if they're they're trying to look up your work or uh want an interview or <laughs> oh, engagement so if you're, yeah absolutely so if you're interested in seeing more about what i'm doing and and what i'm involved in um i've got my own website it's yudit sidikman yehudit sidikman um hopefully you'll stick that in there somewhere typed right yudit <laughs> i am i am so sure you're gonna do that tasha i'm not worried um, and there you can see the types of programs that I have either founded, invested in, or are, am doing everything within my power to make sure that they can bring this important work as far around the globe, in and out of every country that we can possibly get to because the time has come. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you so much for coming on, Yudit. My pleasure. May the force be with you. May the force be with you. <laughs> <laughs>